So to dive deeper into BGP, let's spend some time looking at the BGP peering process because it is so very important to BGP itself how the peering works um, in this process of making sure that routes are carried correctly through the network and etc. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at BGP peering for a couple of these lessons. So let's begin here. BGP uses TCP to offload its transport. Why would it do this? This makes BGP much, much simpler to implement. Um, so it offloads the flow control, it offloads error control, it offloads many of the various um, underlying authentication and encryption tasks down to BGP, which is quite helpful in making BGP a lot easier to implement. Now, on the other side, this means that BGP requires IP to be running before you can actually start the BGP session up. Well, this might not make a lot of sense because BGP is, after all, an IP routing protocol. But what we need to think about is that BGP is natively designed to be an overlay. And I talked about this in a previous lesson, but you need to keep this in mind when you're dealing with BGP. It is really designed to be an overlay protocol. So what happens here is that we are assuming that the underlay is running IP already and that BGP can rely on the underlay IP routing in order to build its adjacencies and build its peering sessions. Now it may be that BGP is being used as an underlay. We'll talk about that later when we talk about data center fabrics and positives and negatives for that. So let's talk through how this works. We need to begin with a very simple concept which is the concept of a passive peer and then of an active peer. So the active peer is the one that's actually sending the open messages and kind of controlling the flow of the open process between the two BGP peers. This is very similar to TCP three-way handshake, and that's kind of where it comes from, in fact. So what's going to happen is let's assume that A is active and B is passive throughout this entire process. A will start by sending a TCP SYN. Now this is just part of the TCP three-way handshake. B will respond by sending a SYNAC, and then A will respond by sending an ACK, or a SYNAC ACK. So this gives you your TCP three-way handshake. Once the TCP session has been set up, A is going to send a BGP open message. Now we'll look at the message formats a bit later for BGP, but for right now just know that there is an open message format and A will send that kind of message to B. Once A has sent this message, it will start a timer called connect retry and it will enter into the open sent state. Now I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail with the states because you can always look them up on the internet if you really want to know, but they are very useful to know for troubleshooting, but we're more dealing with just the generic way these things work so you can understand why they work the way they do here. But the idea is that when you send an open and you enter open sense state, you set this connect retry timer and this timer is going to tell you when to retry the open if B does not send a corresponding open in return. If the connect retry timer times out, never wakes up basically, or wakes up and the session is not continue, is not actually done, what will happen is A will enter what is called active state and it will send another open and continue trying to send open states actively. And so this is because A is the active peer. Of course, B being the passive peer, it is waiting on A to set the timing up and to do everything else necessary. If A sends an open, and then B responds with an open. Then we go into a open confirm state at A. Now at this point what's going on is the two BGP speakers are taking the information in the open message and comparing them to make sure that a, a peering adjacency should actually be set up. Once these have been confirmed what will happen is B will send a keep alive, the first keep alive of the session. Now this is another BGP message format and we'll again talk about BGP message formats in a bit and try to understand what they look like. But when this first keep alive comes up what happens is, is they will move to full state 
I just misspelled that, but that's okay. We move to full state and they will be BGP peers. Now the word peer has a lot of different meanings in BGP. So you have to be very careful when you use the word peer. In some places, people consider peers to be a particular kind of peering arrangement. In others, it is when two BGP speakers are talking to one another and exchanging routes. So two speakers that are talking to one another and exchanging routes are called peers, not neighbors, but peers. But on the other hand, the term peer is used for specific kinds of peering arrangements between providers. So you do have to be very careful about the two meanings of the word peer. So now let's talk about what happens if A sends an open and it thinks it's active and B sends an open and it thinks it's active. This is what is called a collision. Now, in this case, according to the BGP RFC, the BGP specification, one of these, in the case of collision, one of the two connections must be closed. So it gives a set of things here that talks about it. it says the source IP address used by one of these connections is the same as the destination IP address used by the other, and the destination IP address used by the first connection is the same as the source IP address used by the other. A connection occurs, a collision has occurred. One of these connections must be closed. Well, which one of these two connections should be closed in this case? Well, rather than reading all the specifications, what we're going to do is something a little more interesting. We'll look at the FR routing code to figure out how FR routing, which is an open source routing stack, actually handles this particular situation. Because FR routing should, in theory, follow all the relevant RFCs. And this is a very good common thing to do. If you're confused about BGP best path with all the different editions of RFCs that have been stuffed onto it, go find an open source version of BGP, go BGP, or FR routing or one of the others and just take a look at how best path is um, implemented in that code. It can be kind of hard sometimes to get to that, uh, but if you can find it, it's actually a very good way of understanding the entire BGP best path process or whatever else it is you're trying to figure out about BGP. Now, in FR routing, what I have is I have a an if if else statement right here. So either this takes place or this takes place and that determination depends on what happens in here or here. Now, so those are my two options is either option one or option two is either the if or the else if are the two options. Now let's look at the conditions under which the if will take place. If peer status equals established, so therefore the two peers have already exchanged hellos and we already have gotten to the point of getting to a keep alive. So we've gotten past open, open sent, open confirm, and we actually have gotten a keep alive. So now we are in established. Or if the peer status is in clearing. Now what clearing means is that I have an existing session, but I'm actually tearing it down from a TCP perspective. So if in either of these cases, if I receive a BGP open with the exact same IP address pair that I have already had one of these sessions, a session open that's either an established or clearing, then what I do is I send a notification with a notification of cease and my notification code is cease collision resolution. So I'm telling the other speaker we have collided and we need to stop peering on this session. So that should cause the other speaker to fail the connection. And then I return negative one, which is going to allow me to realize there was a collision, the peering did not come up, and I should clear up all the memory stuff that I've done to make that session begin when I receive that open message. Else if, if peer status equals open confirm or open sent. So this means if I've sent an open and received an open, or if I've just sent an open and not received an open, then I'm going to do this. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the, this is the IP address of my local. This is the IP address of my remote, of the, of the one that's trying to open. So I'm going to look at those two and I'm going to say if the local is less than the remote or the remote equals the local. And now, so this is kind of tricky because this is one condition and this is a second condition. If either of these is true, then I'm going to send this notification saying that I have collided. Okay, so if my local is less than the remote, so the remote is higher than my IP address, 
or if our IP addresses are the same and my AS is lower than the other AS, than the remote AS, then I am going to tell the other guy to back off. However, if they are the same and they are, and if my IP addresses are the same and my AS's are the same, then I'm going to log an error and I'm going to send a notification and cease the peering session anyway. So this gives me a sense of how FR routing handles collisions. So let's back through that again. If A sends an open, B sends an open, then B sends a keep, I am now in established state. If I'm in established state and B sends an open to A, A responds with a notification. And the notification will say, cease this new adjacency or this new peer, and it take it down because we already have an existing session on this set of IP addresses. If, however, A is sent an open and B is not sent anything, and then B sends an open that does not refer to A's open at all, then A is going to compare its IP address with B's, and whoever's higher wins. The other one shuts down their session. If A sends an open, B sends an open, and A is in open confirm, and now B sends another open, Again, A is going to compare the IP addresses and determine which one is higher. The higher one wins. Now, in any case where the two IP addresses are identical, which should never ever happen, but if it does, then the AS number is the one that wins. So there is um, a slight modification to this entire process in RFC 6286, which says, that if you are using AS-wide identifiers, so every router ID should be unique, it kind of cuts out the AS check. It just simply says, if they are duplicate router IDs, then shut down the session and don't worry about it because you shouldn't be using the AS number to determine which of the two has the collision or the which of the two should shut down because all of your router IDs within your AS should be unique. Now, another interesting thing about BGP is because it relies on IP and it relies on TCP, you can actually do multi-hop peering. So let's say that B is some sort of a middle box, a, some sort of a firewall or whatever the case might happen to be. I can actually peer from A's IP address all the way across B to C's IP address. So long as this firewall or stateful filter or whatever it is permits the BGP session, this allows the BGP session to come up and I can exchange routes across this session. Now, if I've done things correctly, I can modify my next hops and play with things to make routing work across this middle box that doesn't support BGP. This is really useful in the case of firewalls that don't support a routing protocol, but you want to be able to make sure that the firewall is alive and not dead before you send traffic from A to C, say out to the internet or between parts of an enterprise network or something like this. You can use BGP as a multi-hop liveness protocol. Now, of course, today, you should be able to use BFD multi-hop if it's implemented in your particular routing stack or your particular router to do this same sort of a task. But using BGP is often simpler because I can actually exchange routes as well. Now, another neat thing about BGP multi-hop is I can actually peer between loopbacks. I can set up a loopback at D and a loopback at E, and I can peer between those loopbacks. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, one reason among many, there are many reasons you might want to do this, but one reason among many is you might have parallel links running between D and E. And BGP, up until more recently, did not have the ability to do multiple paths. It didn't have the ability to load share. There was either one path or not. And we'll talk about this a little bit when we get into multipath and other situations. Um, but we talked a little bit about it when we talked about um, when we talked about implicit withdrawals and things like that. So, in this case, what you can do is if you peer over the multi-hop, if you're learning the multiple links via an IGP, like ISIS or EAGRP, what happens is, is the 
interior gateway protocol, the underlay protocol, will want the load share between these two links, which is what you're after. So BGP can actually run loopback to loopback, and then it will have two next tops it can resolve to. And it will resolve to those two next tops using a load sharing algorithm or a hash that will allow you to load share between those two links. Well, that's it for this time for BGP peering. We'll come back with another lesson on BGP peering in just a minute. Oh, <laughs>